I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew 22, all right? We interrupted our series in John, as I mentioned, and we changed course because I think, you know, we're, we're watching a lot of things happen in our world prophetically and, and things that affect us. Oh, by the way, we do have children's church if I think the ladies have already headed out with them but for that, but um, I just lost my train of thought. Wow. I've only been speaking for 40 some years. I mean, you'll forgive me, right? But anyway, uh, there's just a lot of things happening in the world, a lot of things happening in our country. I think sometimes we've got to reel ourselves back in as Christians, okay? And what our responsibility is, and we're going we're gonna to look at a story this morning, an interaction that Jesus is going to have with some of the religious and political people of his day, and we're going to see what we can learn from this, all right? So before we read from Matthew 22, let me just share with you just a couple of things. Uh, back in the late 70s, that's a long time ago, I realized that, when I was in Bible college in the San Diego area, one of the local newscasts came to do a special, not only on our college, which is now San Diego Christian College, but on the Institute for Creation Research. If you're familiar with that, they are the really... Every other creation ministry, Answers in Genesis and others, have really been birthed out of what ICR has done, Institute for Creation Research. And so the, the founder of ICR, it was a new organization at the time, Henry Morris, and Dwayne Gish, who was there from the very beginning, I'll talk a little bit about them in a minute, uh, these media people came to interview them, and I think maybe Dr. Tim LaHaye, since he was the one who founded the college, uh, along with Henry Morris. And they, so they came into this piece. And of course, you know, this is back in the 70s. You probably wouldn't have thought much about it. So anyway, it's the students. We weren't in the actual videos, but they did let us, we did watch the news clip, right? This news media outlet worked very hard to make us look like a bunch of buffoons, really. They treated the guys at ICR, the Institute for Creation Research, like they were just a bunch of uneducated fools who believed that science could support creation. They never mentioned that Henry Morris had a PhD from Rice University, one of the most prestigious educational institutions in America. They never admitted that, uh, they never even said in this piece that Dwayne Gish had a PhD in biology from UC Berkeley that both these men and others in ICR had at one time been evolutionists who once they were, became, became Christians and began to look at the evidence of science became full-blown creationists. They never said that. Their whole intent was to, even back then, to make you know, the Christian world look like we were just a little dumb. But that's okay. Not a, they can say what they want, and that's all right. There is a spiritual war going on. Never forget that. We are locked in a spiritual war that comes out in our world. Well, let's fast forward 40 years real quick to something I came across recently, and he's not, doesn't speak for everybody, but Bill Maher. <laughs> Big fans of his here, I can tell. Um, but Bill Maher, and I'm just I'm not saying that what happened at the Capitol was right. Okay, so let's not go there, but... Of course, he said that was a faith-based initiative, what happened. It was the products of fundamental Christian delusion and things like that. Uh, of course, he's an outspoken atheist. Okay, He doesn't just not attack Christians. He attacks everybody. But he, uh, again, you know, he went off on Christians. And there are Christians out there that are what are called Christian nationalists. I am not one of them who try to wed the Bible and politics, government and God being co-equal, never go down that road because it's simply not true, all right? As we're going to see. I want to live in a moral nation, yes, I do. But I never want to say, you gotta so intricately connect your gov the government and America with Christianity that they're basically one and the same because they're not. And that there are those who believe that, I don't. We were founded on Judeo-Christian principles as a country. We know that, that's unarguable. 
But at the same time, if you read what the mindset of the founding fathers were, their one of their goals was religious freedom because they did not experience that from where they came from. Okay, because there was a national church in England, for example, the Church of England at the time, who wielded a lot of power. Uh, and some of their actual archbishops in the day were actually pretty solid guys, but still, and then when a lot of the people left England and went to other places, they felt the same thing. They were suppressed. And so, without getting into all of that stuff, the point of it is, it doesn't matter whether it was 1979 or 2021, there are people who simply, the Christian faith, they don't like, and it's okay. Okay? It's okay. It doesn't mean that we should never speak our mind as believers. It doesn't mean we shouldn't stand up for truth. We've got a few weeks left in this, and we'll talk about that in the series. Um, but today, we're going to talk about God and government. We're going to get some advice from Jesus. All right? And so I want us to please follow along. I'm going to walk through the passage. But let's begin by reading the text. Matthew chapter 22, whatever version of the Bible you have, follow along. It's the English standard. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. Jesus has just finished telling a couple of parables. And one of those parables was very pointed at the religious leaders. So they didn't like that. So they decide, again, has been going on at this time. For three years, they've been after Jesus anyway, and they want to get rid of him. Uh, as we'll talk about in a little bit, they were very limited in their authority, though, the religious guys. And so they had to take steps to try to get rid of Jesus. And we'll talk about what they did. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances. And we read, tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, they put, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? And he says, show me the coin for the tax. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. They brought him a denarius, and Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, they left him and went away. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for your word. Thank you for those that are here today, those watching online. Lord, I pray that you would bless our time in your word. Give me clarity as I share it, Lord. And I just pray that you would be honored in all that we do and say. For it's your name we ask it. Amen. All right, I'm going to give you a quote from somebody that I think really kind of gets a start of this morning. His name is Glenn Sunshine. Yes, that's his name, Glenn Sunshine. He's a professor at Central Connecticut State University. And, uh, but he's got some really good thought-provoking, th you know, about the Bible and culture and society. I don't, you know, I may not agree with him on everything, but people don't all agree with me on everything. We know this, but I like what he just reminds me of. The church's job is not politics. Rather, it is God's agent to advance the kingdom of God by making disciples, to make the invisible kingdom visible. But what's the kingdom? Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth and thus is Lord of all. The church's disciple-making mission must include teaching what the Lordship of Christ means in every area of life. That's a biblical world view, all right? This includes politics. We need to consider how to apply biblical teaching to our political activities, and he go on and tell you about all areas of life because politics is a slice of the pie of a biblical world view. That includes how you raise children, how you do your job, how you handle your money, it's the lens by which you make decisions and answer questions. That's what a worldview is. Everybody has one. Whether it's written down or not, every person has a worldview. All right? Now, I want to say something about this. You might read that and think, this guy sounds like he's one of those, what we now know as dominion theology. They think that the nation should be brought under the Old Testament law. Uh, there are some guys out there that teach that. I am not one of them, and I don't believe that's biblical. 
uh, and so he's not one of those. There will never be a righteous ruler in the world until Jesus arrives and sets up the kingdom, but there will still be sin in the millennium. If you don't think there will be, read Isaiah and Ezekiel, and you'll discover there is sin in the millennium. There's not, everyone's not perfect who is born during the millennium, but that's for another day. So let me show you something else where we actually get into the text, get all this stuff out of the way. All right, well, let's get into some of the background, okay? I want to just say this real quickly, because I really want to get to the message of what Jesus teaches us. I knew a pastor friend in Arizona many, many years ago, and I'm more of an acquaintance. Um, so he didn't like the government at all. So he didn't want, he wouldn't go get a driver's license, and he didn't want to pay his taxes and all, but he didn't mind driving on the roads that the taxes were used to pay. He didn't mind if he needed the police to get on the phone, call 911. But he was very picky. I mean, just, he didn't like the, in the government sticking their nose in his life at all. But the reality is, you know what? There is a part of life that is Caesar's and a part of life that is God's. And we're going to talk about that this morning. Um, I thought about this because sometimes we struggle with how uh, the government handles the money that they get, the revenue. I often said, if I handle my checkbook the way the governments of the world handle their checkbooks, you'd be visiting me in prison. I'd be the first pastor having his own, well, maybe not the first, I have my own prison ministry, right? I mean, we, so it bugs us when we know that some of our tax money, you ready? Pays for abortions. It does. You say, well, no, it doesn't. Yes, it does. And that bugs me. So that's why there's things like tax reform and stuff. But we're not going there this morning. This isn't a, my political get on my soapbox and, and preach that stuff. So yeah, it is true. that Sometimes government does not handle their money very well. In fact, in the fourth century, Rome had a problem. They had more people living off public entitlements. The government would give them food. They would give them everything. They had so many people in the empire living off public entitlements, they outnumbered the people giving money to the Roman treasury, and Rome was going broke. They didn't have the money to keep feeding everybody the freebies. So it was a problem back in the fourth century, this whole thing about finances and how things are handled and it didn't take long. It was a few centuries later that Rome pretty much, well, ceased to exist, basically as an empire. Let me show you one other thing before we get into our message this morning, because it's a major part of what we're going to read. So here is a coin. Take, it's the year is about 23 to 25 A.D. The guy on the coin is Tiberius Caesar. He is the ruler of Rome. Every emperor in Rome had coins with his face on it. No matter who the emperor was. When Julius Caesar was there as the emperor, he had his own coins minted with his face on it. So Tiberius Caesar's face is on a number of different coins. Uh, so this was one similar to the uh, coin that they're going to talk about this morning in the story. And so just kind of keep that in mind because that guy's face is going to be sort of a tension point that the religious leaders are going to use to try to trap Jesus. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So anyway, I just wanted you to see that. So now let's get into the text. And I've got a bunch of bullet points. Just follow along. The bullet points are not all on the screen just those four to keep us on ta task. But I'm going to talk about, we're going to talk about what Jesus says, and then we're going to get a little, we're going to get practical, okay? We'll ask some questions, and then we're just going to make some practical comments. So let's begin in verse 15. As I said, there's been a conversation, or not a conversation, Jesus has been teaching some things that irritated the religious leaders. They were not happy with him, so they decide to go after him, okay? Now, this story is found in three books. 
in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay, those three Gospels, same story. But I want you to see something. I want you to keep your finger here, and I would like you to run over two books to the book of Luke, all right? I want you to turn there, if you would, to Luke chapter 20. I want you to see something, because it really does show you how desperate these guys were to get rid of Christ. This verse in Luke 20 is not found in Matthew or Mark, but it's an important part of the story. Luke, as he wrote his gospel and did all of his research meticulously, came across this, and and God led him to put it in his gospel. Same story. Again, writers can tell the same story and highlight certain things. It doesn't make the Bible in error or mistake-prone or anything like that. In fact, if anything, it stands, it's a stronger case for the Bible being inspired because, you know, they didn't all sit in a room and copy each other's manuscripts, all right? So look what happens in Luke 20. Same story. We'll back up one verse to verse 19. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable, which he had just taught, against them. <laughs> he was, they were right, but they feared the people. Now here's what they decided to do. Look at the word watched. Don't just overlook that word. The word watched in the Greek describes somebody who comes down. Here's Scott here in the second row, and I come down here. Good name, by the way. Um, and I sit there, and I start watching everything Scott does. But my intention is not good. It's evil. I'm looking for a way to nail him. And so I'm narrowly focused on one thing. I'm going to get Scott. That's what this word here means. These guys came to Christ in our story this morning with one thing in mind. Their mind was evil, their hearts were evil, and they thought, we're going to nail him. Our goal is to get Jesus, and we're going to do whatever it takes to do that. Okay? And then he goes on in Luke 20, and it says, notice this, they pretended to be, what? Sincere. The word pretend is one of the Greek words that you and I will read in the English, hypocrisy. You know what a hypocrite is? A hypocrite is an actor. It was. In the ancient world, a person that you saw on a stage doing a play was called a hypocrite. They were playing a part that really isn't them. Okay? And so these guys are putting on this show. They're acting like they really care. They act, they're acting like they're sincere in their beliefs and in their faith. And they're acting spiritual. Um, here's the deal. Religion doesn't change you. A relationship changes people. Religion is always trying to correct people and change them from the outside in. Christianity's thing is it changes you from the inside out. The Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, all the guys that made up the religious leaders and the religious teachers of the first century, they were very religious, but they were lost. They didn't have a relationship with God, most of them anyway. And so they were, these guys were constantly going after Christ. Anybody can be religious, and anybody can wear a mask, and anybody can claim to be something, but eventually, as you know, you come out that they're not. With that in mind, that this is their intent, they're out to nail Jesus, go back to Matthew 22, all right? So let's work through the story. Shouldn't take long, just bear with me. I always was going to ask you guys a question. I never have yet, but uh, I figured I'd be in here now. I'm in my eighth year, and so maybe I'd take a little liberty. Wouldn't it be cool if one night we just came together and I preached like Paul did in the book of Acts so many hours that a guy fell out the window? We could, but nobody would fall out the window. We could just see how long you could go without falling asleep while I'm preaching. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, I could tell everyone's lining up for that one <laughs> anyway. Let's uh, get back to where we're at. Matthew 22, the Pharisees went and plotted. They got together 
I could see these guys standing off in a smoke-filled room and they're forming their plan in Matthew 22, 15. I mean, for three years, they've been hashing it out with Jesus. And their goal is, we're going to get rid of them. We want to trap them like an animal. It's really kind of a sad thing when you start reading through this. They're going to try to use the Lord's remarks to accuse him. Have you ever had somebody do that? Somebody will take something you say, and they might even twist it to try to get at you. We've all probably seen that. We've all, maybe some of us have experienced that. What I find fascinating is look at verse 16. So they want to trap Christ. So the Pharisees don't go to see Jesus. Who do they send? They're disciples. They're students. It's the young zealots. They, I think they know that Jesus sort of has, uh, well, let's put it this way. I think the old guard figure that Jesus had him pegged by now. And he knew their routines. He knew how the Pharisees acted. He knew what they tried to do. And so they do a different tactic. They send, they send the young bucks. They send their disciples, the Pharisees do. Uh, maybe a new approach. But what I'm fascinated by is there's a group there that's noted in verse 16. And they're called the Herodians. You know who the Herodians were? They were Jews who were supportive of Herod, which most Jews hated. But there was a group of Jews, we don't know much about them, called the Herodians. They were political. They supported Herod, therefore they supported Pilate, and they supported Rome being there as, in a, as an occupying force in Israel. They didn't have a problem with that. But the interesting thing is the Pharisees and the Herodians hated each other with a passion. But isn't it interesting that the two, common in, the two enemies find a common opponent so they decide to work together? Think about that. I've seen this. You read about it. Or you'll hear about it where some people who don't like each other find somebody that they both don't like and all of a sudden... They're working together to deal, to get rid of this person. It's either even happened in churches throughout the years, the centuries. Somebody's teaching a class or somebody's leading some area of ministry and a couple other people maybe don't like how they're doing it. Now, these two people don't get along, but they want to get rid of that person. And so they don't want them doing that ministry anymore. So they kind of band together, though they haven't gotten along at all, just to get rid of that person. The Herodians and the Pharisees hated each other with a passion, but they found a common enemy, and that common enemy is who? It's Jesus. And I, got a th I thought about this. The Pharisees sending their disciples is like the guy that stands behind a, it's going to sound bad, the guy that stands behind a podium or sits at a keyboard encouraging his followers to do all the dirty work while he stays out of the way. See, the Pharisees are doing that. We want Jesus gone, but we're tired of dealing with him, so we'll send our students to do it. We'll give them a, a lesson and, you know, a real live lesson in dealing with Christ. And so it's just an amazing thing. The fact that the religious leaders focused on a political issue is uh, eh, not really surprising because they had very limited authority themselves over the people. Rome had given them a certain amount of authority to the, re the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, the religious ruling body in Israel. Rome had given them a certain amount of authority, but they couldn't, they couldn't make, do anything about what they called the big crimes. You know? They couldn't put somebody to death. They couldn't, certain punishments they weren't allowed to do. So the Pharisees despite their hatred of Rome, their hatred of Pilate, their hatred of everybody, basically, uh, who didn't agree with them, are out to get Jesus, and they're using one of those areas of, the, of life that they usually would want nothing to do with. So they're going to use politics, the political issue, to try to get to Jesus, because they had to get him in trouble with Rome so that something could actually be done. As I've said before, and we've noted this, government is just one part of the pie of life. I think 
our worldview encompasses everything, but sometimes social and cultural issues right now are so much in your face that you can't just turn away from them. They are real, and we have to know how to handle them from a Christ-centered perspective. Before we go a little further in here, in verse number 16 and 17, um, the Pharisees, they even hated the fact that the Romans taxed the people, which I find even just more interesting, that they would come and ask Jesus this question. Because the Pharisees did not want to give a dime to Rome. They didn't want to support some territory that in their mind had come in and wrongly taken over Judea and all of their their lands. Now, they loved the temple tax that the Jews had to pay because that way they could line their pockets and pay to keep the temple upgraded, but they did not, they hated Rome. And yet, they're, like I said, they're going to use this to try to get at Jesus. So Herodians, eh, they didn't, they didn't mind being taxed. They thought it was better to stay buddies with Herod and Pilate because the Herodians had just a little bit of authority. We don't know really what they did, but they had a little bit of authority, and if somehow that came to an end, then they would kind of become, you know, kind of just lost in the fog. And so they didn't mind it. So if you flip over your notes, we're all, okay, we're still working through this, let's move on. So they come to Jesus, teacher, we know that you are true. And you teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Now, everything they say about Jesus is true, but I guarantee you they themselves did not believe it. They are buttering Christ up to try to get him. So they come to him, it's like you pat somebody on the back, you're such a wonderful person, but inside your whole goal is to like get them fired from their job, you know. And that's what they're doing, they're buttering him up. And everything they say is true in verse number 16, but they don't believe it themselves. But if the crowds are around, they know what the crowds are thinking of Jesus by now. I mean, there are people who have been following him by the thousands, Tell us then in verse 17, what do you think? Is it lawful, is it the right thing to do to pay taxes to Caesar or not? You say, well, what's the big deal? Think about it this way. Okay? So... If Jesus says, you don't have to pay any taxes, the Pharisees then run to Herod and Pilate and accuse Christ of what? Causing rebellion against the government. So they're going to try to get him. So if he says, don't pay taxes, then they're going to try to use that angle. If he says to pay taxes, then the Pharisees jump up and say, wait a minute, the emperor's picture, his imprint is on every coin. The emperors of Rome claim to be the high chief priest of the empire. So the Pharisees would say, well, if we have to pay taxes then to Rome, who we hate, then you, Jesus, are an enemy of the Jews because we don't want to pay taxes to Rome. There's only one God. It's not the emperor. It's Jesus. It's, you know, the God of heaven and earth. So they're trying to get him, whether he says pay taxes or not. They think we've got him nailed. You don't nail Jesus. If they haven't figured it out by now, these guys are more thick-headed than I realized. For three years, they've tried everything. They seem to think this is the final way to get him. We've got him now. Either way, he has nowhere to turn. Little did they know who they were dealing with. But Jesus in verse 18, I love this, aware of their malice, meaning depravity or wickedness, he says, why put me to the test? Why are you trying to get me to fall into a sinful situation? And then I love what he says, you 
hypocrites. Every occasion but one in the Gospels that I have found, Jesus' only use of hypocrites is for the religious guys. Isn't that something? And so he looks at them and he says, I know what you're, you're really all about. You're a bunch of hypocrites. You're not even honest. So he says, show me a coin. We saw a picture of a coin. That's what he says in verse 19. They brought him a denarius. That's what you got paid daily for your job usually. The emperor at the time is Tiberius Caesar. He reigned for about 23 years from 14 to 37 AD. Um, even though he's semi-retired in 26 AD, before what we're reading here, he still continued to have a huge influence over Rome. Uh, feelings are mixed on what he was really like. We know he was very paranoid. I mean, he took the life of family members because he was suspicious. But actually, the empire was well off under his reign, and they were at peace. And his taxes were low. But there were some other things he had done that had caused issues. But he is the emperor, so Jesus says, whose inscription, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. And they're thinking, we got him. We're going to nail him now. I love his response. Well, guys, therefore, the word render is a command. A command in the Greek carries the idea that it's not like you're wishing somebody to do something. It's a statement of it's an expectation that you're going to do it. You have kids, you say, take out the garbage. Your expectation is what? They'll take out the garbage. After three or four days of it looking like something's growing out of the garbage pit, you know, you kind of, again, put it down, you know, take out the garbage. It's an expectation of a something you've asked. A command in the Greek, the imperative mode is what it's called. It's a command with the expectation that whoever's receiving the command will do what they're being told. Now, they don't have to, but the expectation is it'll be done. So Jesus says, guys, let's get this right. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Well, that's a problem for some of them, but he's not done. But render unto God the things that are God's. Now, in this case, he's talking about what? Taxes. He's not going to give a civics lesson. That would have been nice. He had pulled open his book and started talking about all the things of what he meant, but he didn't do that. And so when he tells them this, he's trying to get them also to think. In fact, there's a good thought. There's the thought that this emperor that's on the coin may not even have known who Jesus was. Because he died not too long after Christianity really took off. But regardless, the picture of Tiberius was a reminder to people that because they did pay a tax and it was not high under that emperor, that you were part of the empire and so there were amenities you enjoyed. They had the best road system in the world, Rome did. In fact, because of that, it led to the spread of the gospel in the first two centuries at a rapid pace in the ancient world because the road system was so good. And for the most part, citizens were protected so Jesus says, if you're going to use certain things of the government, then just know it's okay to, to fund that. Okay? He doesn't get any further into anything. But then there's something that he says that I think is the most important statement. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but render unto, in the Greek, the God, meaning the only God in the, all the universe, the things that are God's. There is a higher authority. Caesar was seen... In their own minds, these emperors were seen as divine. And Jesus says, nah, Caesar's over here, but the God is up here. And he specifically says the God to emphasize who he's talking about. Christ said, even above Caesar, there is one of greater authority, and that is who? God. Okay? 
Now, we'll talk about some of this in the next few weeks. But I want you to look on your outline with me, okay? He doesn't give a civics lesson. He doesn't tell us, okay, what belongs to Caesar and what belongs to God. So I'd love to say that I, these questions that we're going to have on the screen, I hope, there we go, that are on your, on your outline are just some examples that you as a follower of Jesus, you have to think about, all right? Let me ask a question. Who defines when life begins, God or government? Government has put their nose in, in my opinion, where it does not belong, okay? Psalm 51 says life begins at conception. Luke 1, Jeremiah 1, many other scriptures say that the life, the child in the womb, is a human being. Before we start screaming about what's happening in our country, we've killed 62 million babies since Roe versus Wade. You think that God's happy with our country? Even though we oppose that as believers and we speak out. So we're going to have the guys from Life Plan come in and talk about, you know, caring for the unborn and who defines life. It's interesting, there was a survey, 97% of biologists were surveyed who are the same biologists who say we're, as humans, the problem with global warming. Get this. Almost every one of those 97% said life begins at conception, and these were not Christians. Who defines the gender of a person? God or government? Your DNA. No matter how hard you try to change it, you can't change who you are. You cannot change who you are. And even though we live in a world where government has stepped in, for example, said that a guy can identify as a girl and play women's sports. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's unbiblical. And my worldview is based on Scripture, not on what somebody says. And here's the deal. It's the, the amazing number of cells in your body tells you who you are. There was some guy in England I mentioned before. He claims there's over 100 different genders. How in the world do you come up with that? Unbelievable. The claim we cannot discriminate, as I've heard, as people say, you Christians stay out of this because, you know, you're giving us your, tent, your view. Well, to tell me not to be involved, you're discriminating against me. I'm not allowed to say what I think, but you can tell me that my kids or whatever, my girls playing girls sports now are going to be up against some guy that looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm not saying that'll happen, but who determines gender? Here's a third one. Who gets to define marriage? God. Who has authority over our conscience? Who determines right and wrong? For a Christian, it's the scriptures. It's God. The government can say, no, this is what we're going to do. It doesn't mean I have to agree with it. Who has authority over educating your child? It is not the government. You're a parent, it's on you. Now, you can take the tools if you want, but there is different ways to educate your child. Government doesn't know. You're the parent. So I tell people, you're the parent. Government is not the one who determines you educating your kids. Now you can choose whatever way you want to do that, but I don't agree with the government's. It's not their responsibility. I choose to educate my kids. How I choose to do that is on me, not on them, and not on anybody else. Just telling you. And we've done it all. Homeschool, Christian school, public school. So nobody can tell me, well, you don't understand all of them. Yes, we do. I'm saying that, not saying that to brag, telling you out of reality. So in closing, let me just give you some practical thoughts. Here's the most important thing of everything. Because this is what it's all about. And we're done. Share the life-changing message of Jesus. You know, many people look to other things, including the government, to meet their needs. 
or they expect other people. And they're, they're, some of these people are hurting and they're broken. People need Christ, and we need to be a spiritual hospital as a church, as well as a spiritual university. People need to know that they can find the life-changing message of the gospel right here, that they can know Christ. The second thing is this. Let your voice be heard, but do it in the right way. We don't burn buildings like they do in other Portland and stuff. We don't do that. Colossians 4, 6 gives us a advice on how to speak. Take the steps. Do what's right. Support like-minded organizations. If I'm going to render under God what's God's, render under Caesar what's Caesar's, I'm going to find places that I can also stand behind. Obey the laws that are not against your faith. We'll talk more about that in two weeks. Just because you don't like a stop sign, do me a favor, stop. All right? No more. We used to call them the California rolling stops, man. Come up to stop sign, a guy over there just comes cruising right through it. He looks at you. Man, it's too bad road rage is a sin. No, I'm just kidding, it is. And then I just threw this in there. You know what I tell people? If you really are really, really, really bugged, and God leads you, why don't you get involved, run for office? You know, I'm just telling you. I don't, it's not, you say, that's not in here, no. But it's interesting, in the book of Acts, the apostle Paul leaned on his citizenship as a Roman to make sure certain things were done, that he was treated fairly, right? And so, you know what? It's okay. It would be good to have Christians in office, but your Christianity doesn't, it's not like politics and Christianity wedded together. No, if you're a Christian and you're in politics, if you're, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian and doing that, or a Christian just doing your job wherever you work tomorrow, or whatever, the point of it is Jesus is Lord over every area of our life. Every area. And by the way, the Lordship of Christ, and I'm done, I know, I got on a, I got on a roll, sorry. The Lordship of Christ is not an option. I can say no to the Lordship of Christ as a leader of my life, but he said it best. Jesus in Luke 6, 46, dealing with people that were trying to come up with all the reasons they didn't want to follow him. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I say? Why do you call me Lord, but you don't even do the things that I ask you to do as my follower? He is Lord, and I'm glad he is. Because if anybody else was in charge, the universe would be chaotic beyond belief. Let's pray. You can find more messages like this one at oakridgebc.org and like us on Facebook for encouragement and event updates right to your newsfeed. Thank you for listening to today's message from Oak Ridge Community Church.